Hello and welcome. My name is Michelle Burris. I am a senior policy associate at the Century Foundation, and it is my pleasure to be your moderator today for this very exciting topic that directly or indirectly affects millions of Americans as it pertains to internet access on a daily basis. We are honored to have four esteemed panelists, including a director from Verizon, who we thank for sponsoring this thought-provoking session. For housekeeping, we ask that you please follow these tips and join us on social media. For decades, it has been apparent that there exists a digital divide in America. The pandemic has made it painfully clear to all Americans that we cannot move forward as a society without addressing this fundamental issue. Access to the internet is no longer considered a luxury, but a must have for daily life activities, a civil rights emergency. For generations, the inequities in American society, highlighted by deliberate school segregation, separate and unequal, were so apparent to Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall when he wrote in 1978 that bringing black people into mainstream American life should be a state interest of the highest order. To fail to do so is to ensure that America will forever remain a divided society. We can safely say that Justice Marshall was concerned about the educational inclusion of all Americans. A picture is worth a thousand words. We are here today to have an interactive discussion in regards to the concrete building block steps that are necessary to ensure a proactive difference in the lives of nearly 10 million students. This picture is a small sample of just how innovative our students are to achieve technology access for educational purposes, including kneeling outside of a fast food restaurant to access internet. They have left the security of their homes and their families to virtually learn for maybe countless hours. Now, let's get into the heart of the matter. Our first speaker is Dr. Dia Bryant, Deputy Director and Chief of Partnerships at the Education Trust, New York. We have Mrs. Mia Hall, the Executive Director of Equity and Community Initiatives for Fort Worth, Texas, Independent School Districts, Division of Equity and Excellence. Mrs. Hall is also a member of the Bridges Collaborative. We have Ms. Whitney Stevenson, co-founder, Teens Take Charge, and a student at Mount Holyoke College, Massachusetts. Last, we are honored to have Ms. Kim Mirabella, Director, Public Sector at Verizon. Thank you and welcome to our four panelists. We are honored to have you here today. My first question is for you, Dr. Bryant. You have had the opportunity to integrate your educational experiences into successful policy through leading community partnerships and conducting extensive research on remote learning. Please ground us by providing a historical framework on the digital divide and how has this gap been exacerbated by school segregation and the pandemic? We welcome you, Dr. Bryant. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it is truly an honor to be here and have this conversation today, particularly because I believe the work of the Bridges Collaborative is is and should be a catalyst to continue our work around school integration and it, it really is an honor to be here and, and speak with you all today. So let's just jump right in a little bit and I'll start with a little bit of the current truth. What we know is about 72% of white households and about 62% of black households currently have connectivity within their homes. At the start of pandemic school closures, we know that between 12 and 15 million students were without broadband access. We know now also that about 9 million of them not only lacked access, they also lacked a device. Many people believe that mobile devices sort of fill the gap um, for access. However, it's not totally true because there's a brewing debate right now around what are learning devices and what are not. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Many studies around internet started in the 90s and there were some critical statistics that um, still to this day feel quite alarming. Between 1994 and 1998, ownership of 
computers in the home decreased for black families by about 76 percent and i think that some of that could be attributed to the rate at which technology just changes right and, and we all remember the 90s at least i do um, we went from word processors to, you know, that were huge and took up a whole table. It only had a green, like green lettering with a black screen. And then all of a sudden there was sort of this Apple thing that sort of emerged out of nowhere. And if you had money, then it was able to change quickly. And if you didn't have those resources, it became a little bit more difficult. Currently, Black Americans are about two times as likely to search for internet outside their homes. These are your library users, your coffee shop users, those who use community spaces that have um, been fitted to really support communities in connecting. And during COVID-19, all of that has been limited. I know for me, I really miss my Starbucks days. I would go there on Sundays and just set up shop and work all day. But that's been limited and we know that that further hampers access to information and to digital literacy acquisition. So why is this a problem? Because in 2045, the current projection is that 86% of jobs will require significant digital literacy. Think about what we've done with remote learning. We sort of handed kids a device. We said, take this machine home. If you were a district with money and could afford the devices and afford to put them into the children's hands. And then we sort of said, learn. And we missed an entire gap around literacy, English literacy, technological literacy, the ability to turn on the machine and get to the learning management system or get to the platform that mattered. And I know for me, things change really fast and I even struggle with that. So this has been exacerbated, particularly in black neighborhoods where we know from several studies early in the 2000s that there were many telecom companies that refused to build infrastructure and expand infrastructure in predominantly black neighborhoods. And that's well researched and very, very common. Um, so these are some of the systemic barriers that um, are there. There are also others like credit checks and just social determinants like temporary housing and access to quality health care. All of that sort of impacts a lot of what we see. Um, and it increases the complexity. So um, that's sort of how I see what happens, and we can't mistake that students, especially brown students, are going to these that don't have the access and the infrastructure. So that's how I see it. Thank you, Dr. Bryan. I really want to hone in on your point about how housing also impacts the digital divide, particularly the social determinants. This leads into my next question for you, Mrs. Hall. As a dedicated educator, the Fort Worth Star Telegram newspaper recently highlighted your fall academic initiative. Despite the pandemic, you physically went into communities and neighborhoods to ensure that adults were aware to register students for the academic year. From a practitioner's perspective, please elaborate on how Fort Worth ISD is working to address and close the digital divide. Thank you so much, Michelle. So to begin, I'll talk about what our interventions were. Um, currently, you know, at the height of the pandemic, pandemic we went 100% virtual, right? So overnight, um, we asked our kids, to Dr. Bryant's point, um, to go completely online and, and, and change school, right? And so here in Fort Worth ISD, we had a one-to-one -one initiative in our secondary schools, but that was not the case in our elementary schools which means that we had, you know, tens of thousands of kids without devices. And so immediately, you know, we dispatched whatever laptops, whatever Chromebooks, whatever uh, computers we had in grade level sets or classroom sets um, through drive-throughs at our, at our 144 campuses. And we called on our philanthropic community to help us pay for thousands of hotspots. We've got about 80,000 students in Fort Worth ISD. And again, we deployed those as well. And then also we had to purchase the software licenses, right, for all of our teachers to provide um, the engaging instruction um, and, and build this new platform that we haven't had before for students of all levels, pre-K all the way through 12th grade. And so 
at this time, you know, we are currently in the middle of a TRE, a tax ratification election, um, which is going to, if passed successfully, yield 44 million additional dollars in our budget um, from taxpayers and another $22 million um, from the state in funding. And the focus of that, that money is, has, is geared towards teacher compensation, safety, health, um, uh, PPE, security, um, and also connectivity and devices. To Dr. Bryant's point, and, and also you, uh, 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 Michelle, internet is not uh, a luxury. But overnight, for everyone, there was an awakening where I think that we all could, con on a concerted effort, see that it transitioned from luxury to necessity um, just overnight. Now, with that, there were, there were a lot of challenges. Our first challenge, which led to the walk in the first place and knocking on doors in the community, was communication. Um, I, think, I don't think that we were ignorant to the fact that we weren't reaching all parents. But when it came to engaging our students and getting devices in their hands and getting them registered, um, it became very apparent that we were going to, it called us to action. Um, so communication was an issue. We know we weren't reaching them on social media. They don't have a device. They don't have connectivity. Um, broadband access, right? Even the district, the district network itself. You know, we're not accustomed to having 80,000 students engaged on our network, streaming at the same time along with their, you know, thousands of teachers. And the connectivity in our neighborhoods, you know, just my own personal testimony, I talk on the phone in my commute home every day, and I already know when I turn into my neighborhood, I'm going to lose you. I mean, I prepare my friends, my family, I'm, I'm driving into that zone. But what that translates to for our students that's a dead zone. And that hotspot, regardless if we have a device in our hand or a hotspot in our own home, there's no connectivity there because that is a dead zone. Um, also, the technology learning curve, to Dr. Bryant's, uh, Bryant's point. We have a device for a student. They have connectivity in their home, but they are in the care of grants or they're in the care of parents who don't have the same technological experience or acumen at this time. Um, and so there, that also was a divide. So we saw the hotspots in the home, but they're not being used when we track the usage. And that's because we don't know how to use the hotspot. Or students have the hotspot hooked up and they're online, but they don't know how to use the technology and, and the infrastructure to get the lessons and tune into the instruction. Um, so it was, a, it was an awakening for us all, but I, I feel very proud that we were able to pivot so quickly. And that's not something usually that we can attest to as school districts, we're, we're large bureaucracies. Um, but I am proud how we stepped up, but there is so much work to be done still. Absolutely, thank you, Mrs. Hall. And we're grateful to have Ms. Stevenson because you are continuing that work. You are an activist for many of the students that Mrs. Hall mentioned, the students who may live with, have guardians who do not know how to use internet. So my question for you, Ms. Stevenson, is as a co-founder of Teens Take Charge and a student attending college in the new virtual reality, please provide reflections on the future of digital technology and its impacts on the activist community. Thank you, Michelle. And I also wanna say just thank you for um, this amazing panel and um, Bridge Collaborative for organizing this. I'm truly glad to be here and um, I'm actually glad, um, Dr. Bryant, you brought up around just like talking about the 90s. And so I'm a 2000s baby. So um, computers started coming into schools around that time. And I remember being in class and learning how to type and towards like fourth grade, that's when they started having like the computer carts. And it was the first time I actually seen like classrooms being limited to, like that was the only time I seen the computers in a, in a classroom and then being packed up. And when I got home, there was there was nothing else. I definitely had like the flip phone um, thing going on. <laughs> so that was a, for, a form of technology. And so in connection to that, I wanted to say a lot of the students that you all are talking about, these are the students that we engage with in Team Sick Charge. Um, these are the students who, are, who have graduated and entered higher education and witnessed how college has responded to technology to the assumption of like Zoom is gonna work. Um, and even just speaking for myself, I like with going into higher education and with using Zoom, my internet access, um, that was something I struggled with. One, considering inter internet access in terms of who and how many people are using it at the same time also slows that internet access. And so that was something to also um, 
think about and considering who are the families who have more than, you know, three to four people within their households and how does this impact internet? And so um, in the response to how technology has like, you know, shift this sense of activism and shift these worlds of these students and young people, in a sense, um, it has shown us like um, how previous times have been limited. I feel like we're seeing the, the stretches of technology in terms of like, you know, um, if we cannot make it physically, we could go on Zoom to mobilize, to communicate. Um, also is in a sense of thinking about accessibility. Um, I find it very like, and I think like Michelle, in one of the, the articles you've written about and talking about um, the students, you mentioned how like these things have been neglected and um, in considering internet and technology access. And now is when it's being paid attention to. A lot of times when I, when I look at this, I'm just like, this is something, if we had paid attention to this before, we wouldn't be in this situation. Um, Zoom itself, I think, was um, created 2011. And if you consider students who couldn't make it to class or like how can you um, create accessibility for students who can't be in a space, this kind of process would have been built up to incorporate those students already. And so um, to, to basically say all of this, I say that like students have been pushing, um, they're still mobilizing with seeing these discrepancies um, with just their education, um, being on Zoom sessions, creating plans, and uh, and even these are happening through phones, um, understanding that connections would cut out and like, you know, notifying us, but like, this is very real. Uh, students are having difficulty and I guess like, in the activism world is definitely showing us a different lens of mobilizing and activating um, in different ways, but it's also showing us like who and which can't even enter these spaces or who and which are um, the people we have to pay attention, pay attention to and even try to allow access to be accessible to. And how can we, and, in, and a lot of thing about our spaces too is like we look for resources. Like that's another thing about us as youth is it's like, Whatever we see, I see this, I'm sending it to you. Like, um, we're like, okay, I see that they're, they're having an iPod, I mean, iPad um, give out here, uh, I'm sending you the link. I hear that the DOE is doing this, I'm sending you the link. Like any type of internet access, this, sending it to you. So it's really us communicating, helping each other out and um, just seeing a shift in just like how these things aren't limited and trying to expand to who we reach out to. Thank you so much, Ms. Stevenson. I really want to hone in also when you said resources. And that leads into my question for you, Ms. Mirabella. We know that Verizon has been a valuable resource in helping students get connected. Can you please explain to us the innovative business practices Verizon was engaged in prior to the pandemic and where you are today in addressing and closing the digital divide for our students? Sure, absolutely, Michelle. And uh, certainly I am uh, grateful to be part of this discussion today super passionate about this topic and we've really been living it day in and day out for the last um, eight, nine months here. So thank you for that. So prior to the pandemic, um, Verizon since the year 2012 has, our, has had education at, at the forefront, but not quite to the level uh, that we have now and, and so many things have changed this year. But even prior to the pandemic, um, we had launched a program called the Verizon Innovative Learning Program, uh, where we have uh, invested over $535 million in, um, in technology for Title I schools. Um, and so that's, that's been a huge, a huge program that provides free internet, free tablets and whatnot to a certain segment. Uh, of, um, of those schools. Now, that's obviously just a, a small segment. We realized that, that that opportunity has grown, in fact, overnight, just with what's happened with the pandemic. Um, so we continue to, to make those investments. In fact, during the pandemic, we, we extended that to about 100 additional middle schools. So that was really, really good. But um, also want to mention too, that even prior to the pandemic, we had introduced, we've got kind of a four-pronged approach to uh, our company just in general. And we added what we call a fourth stakeholder. And where companies, you know, a lot of times are interested in delivering on customer satisfaction, uh, shareholder satisfaction, employees, what we really felt we were missing is society. And so we added a whole pillar to our, um, our mantra, if you will, 
for society. And so much so that we set a goal for ourselves, 2.5 million volunteer hours by the year 2025 really instilling in our employee base, get out there and give back, whether it's tutoring to students, whether it's volunteering at a school, whether it's a walk for social justice, whether it's you know breast cancer awareness. So we even prior to the pandemic, we, we were rallied around this idea of giving back to society in, in a bigger way. We feel at Verizon, we have a huge responsibility uh, to make and shape some of these changes that are going to happen uh, in our world today. And so uh, along with the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools, which, which has obviously been a long-term program, which is continuing on, um, we saw this shift happen immediately in the month of March this year, but we all of a sudden had to look in the mirror and say, wow, you know, we hadn't planned on, you know, millions of, of students needing devices. We hadn't planned on teachers not being prepared. We, we hadn't planned on all of the things that came our way. And so we, we quickly scurried, you know, we had this, this plan pre-pandemic, but then we were just kind of turned upside down. And what we did was we really worked with community leaders. We worked with uh, state and local governments. We worked with departments of education. And part of what we really had to do was listen and understand and learn because my daughter happens to be a second grade teacher, so that's good. She's like my personal sounding board for these things. But what we didn't realize is, and the ladies made, made this point earlier, is just because you have a device doesn't mean you know how to use it. And it doesn't mean that a teacher knows how to teach to it. Um, in fact, one of the, the uh, things that came up, which I thought was so fascinating, was you know second graders don't know how to email. They know how to text. They know how to swipe. But you know, some of the education platforms required email inter interaction. So how do you now teach a second grader how to email or do you, or do you, or do you change that approach? So along with the investment and the community support, we said we need to do seminars, we need to do webinars, we need to educate uh, people, uh, teachers, students, parents, because think of the parent aspect. You know, a parent that doesn't necessarily know how to help their child in a virtual learning um, environment. So it does go beyond the technology. And with the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools platform, uh, we have enabled a lot of those learning and educational tools that not only support teachers, but parents and students alike. So this is an ongoing journey that we we're on. We've learned so very much, you know, since March of this year. And I think what what's going to happen at this point is that conversation is already shifting into what's next. You know, what, what do we have to do moving forward to solve the digital divide? How do we need to look at this from an overall infrastructure perspective? And I know that this topic is at the top of our company and, and being discussed in, in board meetings and, you know, we haven't solved for it yet, um, but we're working toward that. And I think what we're doing today is a start it, listening, understanding, working with you know private public partnerships, and that's going to evolve over time. But we've got to continue to keep pushing and continue to have that conversation. Thank you so much, Ms. Mirabella. You exceptionally described why we need a holistic approach to address the digital divide, particularly when you mention infrastructure. I want to bring it back to you, Dr. Bryant. Some of our audience members are involved in the housing sector, and we have heard the term digital redlining to underscore the intersections of housing segregation and internet access. Can you please describe how a student's zip code directly affects the availability of internet access? Oh, where do I start? Um, so there's a very interesting study uh, out of that studied Cleveland, right? And it, and it studied uh, AT&T at this, at this specific time. Now this was early, on let's just say a decade ago. Um, and there was actually intentional uh, effort to not expand broadband in communities in Cleveland that were predominantly Black or Latinx. Now, if you think about how housing is set up in this country, right, we have lots of pockets, it's very insular, right? So you People coalesce around race, they coalesce around um, income, socioeconomic status, um, 
And so we've seen the same thing in the ways in which broadband and cell phone access, you know, sort of and technology in general has been given to students. Now this is even more exacerbated when we look at rural communities. And even in rural communities where income is high, there is issues with technology. Now, when we think about rural communities, they don't get a lot of attention because they're not sort of urban centers. However, when we think about the students that are there and their ability to transcend whatever their challenges are or to be whomever they need to be, access to technology and information is incredibly important. And so I think this notion of red line is actually our greatest impetus to begin to think about, to Ms. Hall's point, technology is no longer a luxury. Like this really is a, a basic utility, right? Could you imagine? And there are some parts of our country that struggle to get water, right? Or struggle with electricity. You live in certain areas, you can't get things. But imagine not being able to connect. And to me, this gives me, <laughs> because I am steeped in the history of Black Black, in the history of Black education in America, this gives me like anti-literacy vibes when we decided that certain groups were not allowed to read and would punish and create structures and all sorts of things to make sure that they did not have access to information. And when you think about technology and the internet as an information hub, what barriers have we set up? How have we become desensitized to those barriers? whose voices are not at the table when we're talking about how to advance. Um, and, and I think we have a lot of work to do here, um, particularly when we think about the 13 million people in America that are unemployed. How are they applying for jobs? Just a real question, telehealth. Think about the intersection of age and race and telehealth. I mean, that in and of itself, to think about if my, my grandmother is 80 years old, cannot log on to her laptop, cannot log on to have a conversation with her doctor about her rheumatoid arthritis. You know, that these are the things that um, need to come to the forefront of the conversation because many of these sort of aging adults are taking care of our babies. As a school principal, I interacted with many more grandparents than I did parents. And so when I think about those grandparents, to Whitney's point, how can they show up for their kids? We've got work to do here. Um, I think that there are very uh, logical ways in which we can do that. That's a great question, Michelle. You know, I'm going to have to get in this computer and start writing about that one. Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. We're in this work together. I want to pause here and remind our attendees, for those of you who are viewing through a video, please submit your questions via the chat. If you are joining us from Zoom, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. We will be leaving time for Q&A discussion, and we look forward to your robust and an informative discussion. I want to really expound on school segregation a little bit more. Mrs. Hall, Decades of legal and educational research have highlighted the continual discipline disparities associated with students of color. We would assume that suspensions are declining. However, the research shows us that black and brown students are disproportionately suspended even on virtual learning platforms. For example, ProPublica highlighted the experience of a 15-year-old black girl with a disability who was sent to a juvenile detention facility for simply not completing her homework. Federal data has identified that Black students with a disability are the most likely to suffer these harsh abuses. Mrs. Hall, what would be your leadership approach to dismantle this racial disparity? And what are your reflections on the inequitable discipline practices on virtual learning platforms? So that's a really, really big question, Michelle, but I thank you for it. Um, fortunately, I do serve, um, I, I work in Fort Worth ISD um, a school board president in a neighboring ISD in Crowley ISD. And in both of the districts that I work and serve, we're committed um, to equity um, and, and specifically racial equity. And so in Fort Worth ISD, we have a division of equity and excellence. Um, we've been around for about five years. It's, it's where I work. 
um, and Crowley ISD, we completed a, an, an equity audit about two years ago. And that equity audit is the center and focus of our strategic planning and has been for the last two years. Um, but yes, we recognize that inequities exist, right? And there, if there was inequities face-to-face, -face, then obviously there will be inequities in the virtual environment as well. But our, our approach and my approach um, is that, you know, the trainings that we're doing, uh, the, the initiatives, we, we employ the use of Glenn Singleton's Courageous Conversations. We isolate race. Um, we're helping um, to expand the cultural proficiency of our staff and not just, you know, those who are face to face with our students, meaning teachers, but our entire staff, starting with our superintendent, our school board, and all the way down through our structure. Um, we have our implicit bias training, right, so that we know how we show up in a space, what we bring with us, what those pre preconceived notions are, and how we interact with our students. And of course, um, the social emotional supports. Um, if anything, we were already working in that space, but the COVID-19 pandemic um, has highlighted the need uh, for social emotional supports for not just our students, but also for our educators, right? Our, our frontline workers. And then also, um, culturally responsive practices, right? Making sure that our teachers are adept um, and that we have allies and co-conspirators in our work. And so the whole idea is that we strategically, systematically, that we implement these practices and these professional developments in our, in our schools, in our school system, and not on a voluntary basis. It has to be something that we all embrace, that we all support, and that we mandate as an expectation to be an employee or a stakeholder or a participant in our system and those who interface with our students and their families. Um, but our hope is by using um, the, the, the skills, the attributes, um, and the exposure that we have through these initiatives that we will minimize those incidents of discretionary discipline measures. Um, there are some things that statute mandate for us, but a lot of our suspensions and our exclusions of students from instruction are discretionary. And so we need to learn how to, we need to give our teachers, the people who interface with our kids, um, the strategies they need, um, how to get to know each other. If they know more about our students, um, understand what biases they bring, then hopefully the interactions between them will be more successful and we can appropriately get the kids the supports that they need in order to minimize what could be sometimes behavioral incidents in our classrooms. Um, and one of the things I'd like to mention that we are doing in Crowley ISD, and it was a very sensitive topic because we embarked on this before the pandemic, is that we're introducing our own police department. And we were very apprehensive about that as a board because who needs more policing, right? But we felt like it's an opportunity to shape our department with those social emotional supports and, and groom our officers and how we want them to interact with our students. Um, so I feel like just a myriad of intention and systemic strategies will help, I hope, deter and minimize um, those incidents of exclusions for our students. Thank you so much, Mrs. Hall. I was really struck by also that you're a school board president and you're also a director of equity and community initiatives in two different districts. So it was very, really insightful just to hear that perspective. I want to bring it back to you, Dr. Bryant, for a minute. Your recent writings really highlight why there needs to be a systemic need to transform remote learning. To go along with Mrs. Hall, have you seen some additional innovative practices that school leaders have done to transform remote learning? Yes, I have. Um, and I, I think I would talk about just three specific groups that we see leading the way. Um, I think an important uh, thing about this moment is that we are all having a unified experience. The human experience, it has been so connected and stitched together by COVID-19 in a way that we are all sort of feeling a lot of the same things and seeing things that we didn't see before. And so when I look at school leaders, what I'm seeing with school leaders specifically across New York State is, is this pooling of resources, right? Like, you know, I've got the good, you know, ELA teacher or I've got the good parent council. Like, let's start putting these folks together. And you're seeing that happen across district lines, which is something that is so important. And I, I think it has 
some of the most promising uh, sort of attributes when we think about advanced learning and access to advanced coursework. You know, if a school in deep Long Island can coalesce with it or work with a school in Brooklyn to bring more AP to students or bring more IB to students or to support our middle school students to have algebra, we're seeing that happen. And I, I hope that we can continue to think that through once we sort of return to normal if we ever do. So that's school leaders. Community-based organizations are filling gaps, y'all. They're filling gaps. And if you have not activated student or community-based organizations, it's a big miss. We have seen community-based organizations open their doors to fill gaps for childcare and to fill gaps to support students in having a safe place to learn virtually. One of the conversations we haven't had a lot is just because I'm at home doesn't mean I like being there, right? I grew up in Detroit in the 80s and home was not my favorite place. I excelled because I just loved doing my schoolwork and being at school because I could actually avoid the things that were happening in my home. And so many community-based organizations have opened their doors to be hubs for positivity, for learning, a space where kids can just be themselves and, and have a safe space to really think through the work that's in front of them. And families are doing something too. And I think this is one of the most inspirational things. Um, there are families who live in close proximity. You've got cousins and aunties and uncles all living in the same town. And I read a story about a family that decided to convert one basement in one of the family households into a full classroom for about 15 or 20 family members. Could you imagine? You talk about a one room schoolhouse with the people you love and y'all are all learning together and just, you know, sharing cultural sort of traditions that could be passed on, spending lunch with your cousins, and they all have their own learning stations, right? So there are things that people are, ha that people are doing. And I, I think that when you look specifically at families that are often under-resourced, under they are generally our, more, our most resourceful and our most creative in moments like this. And I think people are trying. And I think that the government and our leaders must step up and um, support them as they work to fill these gaps. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. That really leads into my next question about filling gaps. And we know that Verizon has been filling the gap with partnerships. And so Ms. Mirabella, I wanna kind of end the discussion with asking you, with the advent of the pandemic, how has Verizon identified additional partnerships with school districts that will expedite the goal of focusing on the digital divide in the educational arena. Great, thank you, Michelle. So when this all started, we kind of came to the realization that, you know, it would be great to just fill gaps here and there, but programmatically, what are we gonna do? We need a program around this. And so what we did is we put our heads together again in conjunction with community, uh, with the DOEs across the nation, and you know, we determined that we needed a program. You know, we needed a way to get devices into the hands of children, hotspots, internet access, um, at a at a price that was going to be affordable, right? I mean, for for most for most people, um, that's a, a barrier to entry. And so, what we wanted to do is is fill that gap. So we came up with our national distance learning program. At this point, we are serving over a million students on that program. That's just one of the programs. Of course, you heard me mention the Verizon Innovative Learning Program for Title I uh, earlier, which is handled by the foundation. But the National Distance Learning Program, um, you know, we didn't realize, we thought, well, you know, it could, it could take off in maybe a couple of different states. But now we've got the entire country uh, leaning into the program. And like I said earlier, um, we started with connectivity, but then we realized it was so much more. And so I think as we follow through on that and make sure that we listen and we learn for first and foremost, right? Because we want to get it right. Um, and now that we know that this is a conversation that has to continue, we have to figure out how we solve for the digital divide in conjunction with you know, the Century Foundation and other partners in the industry and, and even our competitors. 
you know, this is going to require that at some point, you know, we, we work together uh, on, on behalf of, of the nation and really come together with the, with the solution. So we're doing that in pockets. We just rolled out our home uh, LTE service to 48 states. We just announced 5G nationwide. So there are technologies that we're putting out there that are going to help. And then along with our distance learning program, the bills program, we've got to accelerate all of those things um, because the time is now. Um, it was said earlier, you know, how great would it have been? I think Whitney, you mentioned it. If we had thought about this before the pandemic happened. So now's our chance to stand up uh, as an organization and, and as a country and figure this out because it's the right thing to do. It's our future. You know, these kids represent our future and um, they, they need to have uh, access uh, just like everyone else. So we are super uh, passionate about it. You can count on Verizon to continue to be a big part of this conversation and a part of the solution as we work through um, what options that provides in the coming days and months. And, and uh, certainly look forward to working with the Century Foundation and listening and learning to what it is that we need to do uh, to shape these programs moving forward. So I'm excited about the future. I, and I, I like you, I'm, I have promised because of all the creative things that are being done. I mean, we've got routers and Wi-Fi being put in school buses and people driving to school parking lots to get access. So the creativity, to your point, I, I've never seen anything like it, and, and it's incredible. So keep the ideas rolling. We want to be a part of that conversation. We'll, we'll be happy to spearhead those conversations, and uh, just Verizon is excited to be a part of it, and um, look forward to the day when we can say everyone has internet access. Thank you so much, Ms. Mirabella, and we at the Century Foundation are also honored to be a part of this collaboration. I know we're running low on time, but I want to ask our panelists, can you please take 10 seconds to give a closing statement or either outline one concrete step the attendees can take to close the digital divide, particularly within your sector? What is our call to action? We're going to begin with you, Dr. Bryan, if you can just give us 10 to 20 seconds, please, and we'll get to one question. Sure. This one is for advocates. Um, every advocate wants to be in the New York Times. You want to hit the Washington Post. Um, we are hoping to amplify by having a million tweets. Back to my point about anti-literacy. I am asking advocates to publish in places where there are no paywalls so that folks have access to the most important information about their communities with clear on-ramps to the information without a credit card, without anything. So I am asking that we make information more public and more available. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. Mrs. Hall? I'll go fast. So engage your elected officials, your school boards, your city councils, your mayors, engage your philanthropic communities and your business communities to help stand in the gap and make these resources available for our students. And also training professional development for not just your teachers, not just for your educators, but also for your families and how to use the resources and the new instructional materials that we have. Um, our black and brown students are the greatest population of students who are participating in this virtual environment right now. And as educators and as a society, we now have two fronts. It's not only just a digital divide, but we also still have the achievement gap to close. Yes, Ms. Stevenson. Okay, so I'll make it quick. So this is to um, students and educators, first to students and just the youth. Uh, and something that's been repeatedly spoken about is creativity and being innovate, innovative. And we're seeing that technology could be inaccessible, but something that's always accessible is our mind. And so my thing is saying is like, keep thinking of these ways and getting access, keep thinking of these ways of like, even if you find access to yourself, how can you share it with someone? How can you get it? How can you make a community base? Even what Dr. Um, Bryant was saying um, about just like these community organiza organizations just like elevating during this time. How can you create a community and connect that? And so educators, um, realize the students you have, realize how may have they, how are they tapping into internet access? Um, are they using their phones? Um, do you notice, are they getting cut out? Um, also just realizing if their screen is off does not mean they're um, like, not engaged that could mean that like there's insecurities housing insecurities that they do not want to show or just just a sense of just like you know um there's so many things there and i feel like to consider in being present in the classroom so. absolutely thank you so much miss stevenson miss mirabella 
Thank you. And I just want to go back to uh, something that was said prior, and that is just listening, being able to connect and understand what's needed. Local communities, right? Community organizations, um, that they're, the private sector and public sector have got to come together. Um, you heard Dr. Bryant talk about, you know, all the amazing people out there that are willing to help. Um, and it's really just about bringing everybody together for a common cause. Um, and Verizon understands that. So I would just say, reach out to us. We'll continue to listen and learn and be a part of these forums um, and definitely want to be part of, we will be a part of the solution. So it, just excited to be a part of um, this forum today. And um, I would just say, let's, let's continue to work together. Our work has just begun. Thank you so much, Ms. Mirabella. I have seen the questions, they are amazing. Unfortunately, we will not get time for questions, but we will be sending out responses via email. Unfortunately, we are out of time. This was informative, stimulating, and so insightful. I would like to sincerely thank our four outstanding panelists, Verizon, and you for your valuable time and participation. Let's continue advocating and please have a safe and fantastic weekend. Thank you and take care.